This is the story of the little ships. It's the story of the rescue at Dunkirk during World War II. In 1940, I lived with my father in the town of Deal on the Kent coast of England, safe from the thunder of the Germans' guns in France. Some days in May I could hear it, rolling in big booms across the English Channel. Some days I could feel it rattling the glass in the windows on our street. My father, Martin Gates, owned the Lucy, a sturdy fishing smack. Her wooden tubs were thick and heavy and smelled of herring and mackerel and cod. I liked to watch my father's quick hands stacking tubs and sorting fish. I liked to listen to Dad's friends trading stories on the beach. They were all deal fishermen, too. But now their talk was about the trouble at Dunkirk, just across the channel, only 50 miles away. British soldiers were trapped there, they said. Thousands and thousands, and so were the French. The Germans and their tanks would capture them. Families would lose all those men who were uncles and brothers and fathers and sons. Every boat on the English coast was needed to go and help. The owners were to report for orders and for maps and charts. My brother John was a British soldier fighting in France. Maybe he was in this trouble too. Maybe he was trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk and was waiting for a navy ship or a fishing boat like the Lucy to bring him home. Fishermen on the beach said I was my father's daughter. I could set an anchor and coil a rope and nudge speed into the Lucy's old engine better than some of the village men who were signing up to go to Dunkirk. Like Mr Lewis who worked at the post office, Mr Cribbin the locksmith and Mr Marsh who had taught geometry to John. So I pulled on the wool cap of my father's that smelled of herring and attached a pair of John's outgrown trousers. Only my father knew it was me. Hurry, not much time, too many men, not enough ships. Those were the words we heard echoing in town and up and down the beach. I hurried to help Dad stack cans of water. I lugged more cans full of fuel and yards of rope and I hurried again to haul the wet nets off the Lucy. We'll need every inch of room for soldiers, my father called to me over his shoulder. Maybe even John, I called back. That afternoon we sailed for Dunkirk. Dad didn't have much time for talk. He kept his words in his hands, stowing a rope ladder and checking the engine gears. And he kept his words in his eyes, reading the channel charts and maps, scanning the sky thick with clouds. My father wasn't famous, but he knew about the sea and the tides and currents and how to steer clear of the good wind sands. He was the one who had taught me to read a compass and he could name all the stars at night like the explorers I had studied in school. So on the last day of May, the Lucy left Deal and sailed north to Ramsgate to join a motley group of ships. All kinds were in her convoy. Farther out in the channel, past the Goodwins, our group joined with others. It was like an amazing armada. Armada? It was a word from my school book. And there I was in the middle of the biggest armada of all. That day, the line of convoys going to help rescue the British Army was almost five miles long, stretched end to end, on a smooth grey sea. To save time and fuel, tugboats and bigger ships pulled little ships in their wakes. A lot of tow ropes frayed and snapped. A lot of rusty motors sputtered and stopped. I listened to the low throb of the Lucy's engine hour after hour, mile after mile, steady engine, steady friend. The dozens of ships around us were headed to Dunkirk too. The littlest ships looked even smaller under that sullen channel sky. Everyone in the boats around the Lucy knew there was terrible trouble up ahead. Big navy ships passed with their white wakes going the other way, headed back from Dunkirk to England and to home. They made a silent parade, not grand, just uniform brown and battleship grey. Their decks and railings were crowded with men. I tried to look up and find John in that sea of tin helmets and tired faces, but they were the faces of strangers and not my tall, skinny brother. Dad handed me a mug of strong sweet tea and a woolly thick jacket to keep off the channel chill. When our convoy reached the French coast, we heard the German guns. Other guns were answering back. And then the Lucy was there, off Dunkirk's beaches, in the night and in the early morning, and it was real. All the oily smoke that got in my eyes and all the terrible noise that got in my ears, and all the men. The sandy beaches at Dunkirk were black with lines that curved like snakes, and the lines were British soldiers. And the French were there too. There were even men standing shoulder to shoulder along the length of the mole, the narrow wooden pier in Dunkirk's harbour, thousands of soldiers waiting for ships. We stayed close to a minesweeper, then sailed into the shallows to ferry our first load. I called back the depth of the water as Dad steered the Lucy towards the beach. 
Not a beach like Deal's. This beach was wide and flat, its sand covered with men who were hungry and thirsty, by horses running loose from their French riders, by dozens of barking dogs, by trucks and equipment, and by the wild mess of an army on the run. And there were hundreds of other ships that were a little like ours. English and French, Belgian and Dutch, we were all there rowing and carrying and paddling and ferrying from the sand beaches to the big ships anchored out in deeper water and back again. My father gazed at the thousands of men and I knew that he was thinking about John. He stood at the helm, holding the Lucy steady in the water against the wakes from other ships, against broken planks washing toward the beach, against lost boots and army coats and everything that soldiers leave behind when they can take only themselves. I had to stand taller and help my father. I had to help soldiers whose names I never knew and not, afraid that I, and not say that I was afraid to see war. I had to pretend that my arms didn't ache from hauling soldiers dripping wet onto the rocking deck of our boat. My hands were rubbed raw inside the work gloves that fit my father, not me. Most of Dunkirk was burning. Town and harbour, houses and docks, I had to rub the sting from my eyes, not from tears, but from the black smoke. And I couldn't look for more than a second at a soldier who cried for me to give him water, who had no bandages, just blood all down his front. We ferried a Cameron Highlander who couldn't find his regiment and a red-faced cook who spoke only French and so many British soldiers that I lost count of how many in all the Lucy's loads out to the big ships. I saw two men side by side in a half-swamped rowboat pulling on oars for hours, ferrying a beaten army, a few men at a time. I saw a plank raft with a rusty old bicycle strapped down with bits of rope and a soldier who'd lost his helmet but who brought a parakeet in a cage. I saw men who were brave and some who were not. I heard shouts in English and in French and in Belgian and in Dutch. Get the men off the beaches. Get the men off the mole. Get them onto ships. Get them back home. That was the job we had to do. That was the job. And we each had a part. I kept checking the Lucy's fuel. When only two cans were still full, we followed a Smoky Joe, which is a nickname used in the British Navy for a minesweeper, and a Dutch Scoot, which is a flat-bottomed Dutch boat originally known as a Schoot and turned to head home. My father and I prayed that John, if he were here, had found a place on a sturdy ship. Suddenly the sky was filled with the noise of an enemy plane. It was a dive-bombing German Stuka. Some stray bullets hit the Lucy and she sprang a dozen leaks. Our last load of soldiers had to bail with their helmets on the miles going home, but the Lucy's engine kept steady and with that throb that I knew so well. And then we were there with dozens of other ships, streaming into the safety of the harbour at Dover, bringing our army home. I helped my father look for John among all the ships unloading men. I asked busy officers who were yelling orders, but no one could tell me. The ships crowding the harbour were full of tall skinny soldiers, but none were John Gates from Deal. Mr Lewis and Mr Marsh spotted the Lucy and came to tell us how they'd been towed by a Scottish trawler all the way back to the White Cliffs of Dover. And then they looked away and said Mr Cribbin wouldn't ever be coming home. And so we went back to Deal and sailed the Lucy onto the narrow beach. We kept the black matted dog that a French sergeant had asked us to take. I named him Smokey Joe. Smokey, with his damp rope collar, was a part of Dunkirk that we brought home to Deal. On June the 3rd, we got word that John had come back safely on a Belgian tug. And the very next day, I sat by the radio with my father and Smokey Joe. I sat straight up when the Prime Minister thundered his grand speech. I was glad that Mr Churchill didn't keep his words in his hands and in his eyes in the way of deal fishermen. At first he had thought only a few men could be saved from the beaches of Dunkirk. He was wrong. The newspaper later said that over 338,000 men came home. But I think Mr Churchill knew all along that our country could do it if everyone pulled together. And that's why he sent all those big navy ships and the little ships like our Lucy to. This is a note from the author. In May of 1940, many countries in Europe were at war with Germany. British and French soldiers, half a million of them, were trapped on three sides of northern France by German troops and tanks. The only way out for the Allied army, the only escape, was the sea. 
<clears throat> An incredible armada of 861 ships, the largest at the time in naval history, assembled off the beaches of Dunkirk to ferry British and French soldiers across the English Channel to Dover and other small ports in southeastern England. Vice Admiral Bertram Ramsey, who organised these rescue efforts, directed Operation Dynamo from his headquarters in the chalk cliffs of Dover, just across the channel from Dunkirk. He called the rescue armada his cockle shell fleet because of the hundreds of small river and coastal fishing craft that answered the government's call to assist the larger ships of the British Navy. Of the 338,226 men rescued, most came back to England on the bigger ships, but the little ships had their part to play during the crucial nine days. May the 26th to June the 4th, ferrying hungry and t exhausted soldiers from Dunkirk's beaches across the dangerous shallow water to the bigger ships. Many dogs that were pets of English and French soldiers and a few strays were rescued as well. Almost 200 dogs were aboard ships landing in Dover. There are as many stories about Dunkirk as there were ships and people involved. This story is part truth, part fiction. It could have happened. Maybe indeed it did. And finally, here's part of Winston Churchill's speech on June the 4th. You think back to when we talked about persuasive speeches, we listened to a little bit of his. We must be very careful not to assign to this deliverance the attributes of the victory. Wars are not won by evacuations. Even though large tracts of Europe and many old and famous states have fallen or may fall into the grip of the Gestapo and all the odious apparatus of Nazi rule, we shall not flag or fail. We shall go on to the end. We shall fight in France. We shall fight in the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on the landing grounds. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall fight in the hills. We shall never surrender, and even if, which I do not for a moment believe, this island or a large part of it were subjugated and starving, then our empire beyond the seas, armed and guarded by the British fleet, would carry on the struggle until in God's good time, the new world, with all its power and might, steps forth, to the rescue and liberation of the old. That's the end.